Thanks. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome David Paget, uh, who's an associate professor of geography, and he's the director of the Geographic Information Sciences Laboratory at Tennessee State University. Tennessee State's a, a historically black university uh, in, in Nashville, and it's a, it's a land grant institution. It's the only state supported uh, historically black university in the state of Tennessee. Uh, Professor Paget has conducted uh, uh, GIS workshops uh, at the annual Historically Black College and University Faculty Development Conference, National Service Learning Conference, and multiple other colleges and universities. Since establishing <clears throat> the Geographic Information Sciences Laboratory at Tennessee State back in 2000, uh, Professor Paget has supervised multiple undergraduate research assistants in a variety of service learning projects. Uh, the topics of which include community-based global positioning systems, mapping to, imp to improve uh, public transfer, uh, transport accessibility, GIS-supported homeless population mapping, and a GIS mapping of Nashville's Red Cross emergency centers. Uh, the GISC lab has developed working relationships with a variety of, of grassroots groups, nonprofit organizations, and government agencies. Um, Professor Padgett has a super long CV of, 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 of honors, but you know, some notable ones. He was awarded the American Association of Geographers Presidential Achievement Award for significant contributions to advancing geography, GIS, and STEM education within historically black colleges and universities in 2019. Um, so uh, Professor Padgett is, is part of a group of talks that I've, I've organized towards the end of, of our seminar this year. Um, dealing specifically with environmental justice issues uh, within the context of our system science. And so I'm really excited to kick things off. Um, we'll turn it over to you now. David, thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen now and then get this presentation up. Can everybody see that? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, goodness. Oh. Zoom. All right, I do this every day. Let me try this. Can you see it now? Yes, that looks great. Okay. We see the whole PowerPoint interface, so we see all of the slides. Yeah, I'm gonna slides. go That's to slideshow. All right, so, um, awesome. so as I mentioned in the abstract, when you hear environmental justice or injustice uh, as it relates to cities, uh, Nashville isn't one of those cities that normally comes to mind. You hear about, you know, Harlem uh, in, in New York and that the rich environmental justice history there. Of course, Warren County, North Carolina, um, Chicago, Illinois, at Gale Gardens uh, and Hazel Johnson, uh, New Orleans and, and Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and that whole Cancer Alley region. But Nashville isn't usually mentioned uh, along with those places, but uh, we have had a uh, pretty substantial uh, history with regard to environmental justice and injustice. And a lot of the um, issues have involved uh, earth system sciences and, and, sub, and subdivisions, sub disciplines therein. Uh, and so the title, uh, A Brief History of Environmental Injustice in Middle Tennessee, from urban renewal to toxic landfills to brownfield development to urban mining to green gentrification. And so I will get through as much of this as I can. Uh, but before we start to talk about any kind of environmental injustice in any city, we have to talk about urban renewal. Uh, the urban renewal program, which is really at the roots of a lot of the uh, concentrated poverty that we see in cities. It's at the root of a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, segregation that we see in many cities across the country. And so um, urban, the urban renewal program, I guess it could be filed under the pathway to hell is often paved with good intentions. Uh, so, so notice in this picture, it says Nashville houses uh, circa 1960, all demolished in urban renewal. Uh, so why were these houses demolished? Well, some of these houses uh, didn't have indoor plumbing, uh, didn't have uh, running water, uh, didn't have heat, didn't have air conditioning, 
my father grew up for part of his life in a house just like this, where they had to go into the backyard to use the facilities. Uh, and he said they had to watch out for snakes while you're using the bathroom, imagine that. Um, so clearly these types of houses uh, were deemed as being unhealthy. Uh, they promoted a lot of diseases that took the lives of babies. Uh, infant mortality was relatively high. Um, my grandmother, for instance, uh, gave birth to four children. Only my father and uncle lived. Uh, so children were taken by typhoid, rubella, mumps, measles, all of these diseases that to some degree were related to substandard housing. So the goal in urban renewal was to tear down all this substandard housing and move people into public housing, which might be a surprise to younger people to think that going to public housing or the projects is a step up, but it certainly was in some cases because you a uh, family would go from a shotgun house with no indoor plumbing, no electricity into a housing project uh, that had all of those amenities. However, uh, as most of us know, public housing was not sustained by the federal government uh, really starting as we started to get into the 1970s and it fell into disrepair and then you had the drugs and everything that we now associate, all the ills we associate with public housing. Uh, but when these large expanses of communities were torn down and people were moved into public housing, that served, that resulted in what we call concentrated poverty. Uh, and so this is when we first started to see concentrated poverty in black communities in cities. Um, now, Nashville had a unique situation, well, not unique to Nashville. Uh, the interstate highway system uh, often resulted in Black communities being destroyed. And so the Jefferson Street Corridor, Tennessee State University and Fisk University and Meharry Medical College, all um, Black uh, educational institutions are all on Jefferson Street, essentially. Um, interstate 40 was built straight through the heart of the black community in Nashville beginning in 1960. It destroyed a place that had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of black owned businesses. Thousands of black homeowners were displaced and moved away. Uh, the community fought back. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, unfortunately and obviously uh, the black community fighting against Interstate 40 was not successful. So this was another, but this Highway, interstate highway plowing through a black community is not unique to Nashville. This has happened all over the country. Greensboro, North Carolina, Miami, Florida. We can go on and on and on. Um, so in 1973, uh, half of Nashville's garbage went here to the Bordeaux landfill. Bordeaux was a community, a black community, which at that time was a suburb of Nashville uh, where African-Americans moved after the Housing Rights Act was passed in 1968. So the 1968 Housing Rights Act was passed largely in sympathy to the assassination of Dr. King earlier that year. Um, but it really, I guess, was supposed to provide some uh, defense against the redlining and also some other racist uh, housing policies in many cities. It didn't solve all of them, obviously not. Uh, after 1968, a lot of more uh, established, educated, and wealthy African Americans moved out of those centers of concentrated poverty to, to the suburbs to live the American dream. Uh, so the people that moved to Bordeaux uh, during this time were the Black intelligentsia of Nashville, doctors, Tennessee State University professors, attorneys, uh, people in city, in, in, people in positions of influence, people in the faith community, so the Bordeaux landfill case flies in the face of those who claim that environmental injustice is about class. Uh, the, the argument is, hey, we're in a capitalist society. Uh, those who work hard are rewarded. Uh, if you don't work hard, then your punishment in a capitalist society is to be poor and to deal with all the negative externalities that come along with being poor, such as living next to a landfill. But Almost all of the research that's been done on environmental justice and injustice shows that it's race, not class, 
your race is much more uh, is a much more is a greater predictor of whether or not you'll live next to something like like this landfill. Um, and so you can't make the argument that these, this was a poor black community. This was Bordeaux is still not a poor, uneducated black community, but yet they still got stuck with this landfill. When the city decided to find a place, to put a landfill, let's put it next to these black people in Bordeaux. And the um, black community fought for 20 years to finally get that landfill removed. Um, one of the leaders of that fight, um, Senator Thelma Harper, who was the first uh, African-American female senator in the state of Tennessee, she was a housewife who became active in this environmental justice movement and eventually became the uh, a state senator, the first African-American state senator in Tennessee. Uh, she just passed away, I think, last week, and she was a T at Tennessee State University uh, graduate. Uh, the other half of Nashville's garbage went here, the thermal transfer waste energy facility. Uh, again, it sounds like a good idea. Let's burn trash, turn into electricity. Sounds great. And, and if you notice, this is a, a front page New York Times story uh, describing the uh, thermal uh, transfer corporation facility in Nashville. It was, this was state of the art technology in 1973. Unfortunately, it came with some negative externalities. Uh, the, the garbage was not um, were they doing Star Trek uh, vaporized? It wasn't vaporized, it, it was burned, which means that there's going to be some byproducts such as air pollution. So notice that this facility was completed in the exact same year as the Clean Air Act, right? 1973, which probably explains why it was out of compliance with the Clean Air Act during, during its entire existence. You can see that plume of smoke coming out of the top of it. I remember flying into Nashville while the plant was still there on a cloudless day, not a cloud in the sky. And I would look down and I would see this one looked like a cumulus cloud uh, over top of Nashville. I'm like, what is that? It was the thermal plant. You know, it would just produce. And what was worse is that the air pollution fallout would wrap, would go across the Cumberland River to the Casey Homes. Casey Homes is still the largest public housing community in Nashville, about 2,400 uh, um, residences, mostly African-American, mostly women and children. And speaking of the children, Casey Homes has the highest uh, case uh, cases of pediatric asthma uh, in the city. Uh, and so what really makes this offensive is that these children are already at a disadvantage living in public housing. Now they're being exposed to air pollution, which triggers asthma attacks. Guess what is the number one reason why children miss school? Asthma. So now the one thing that lifts people out of poverty, education, the one chance that you, or these children might have to get themselves to the next level to perhaps experience the American dream, they can't get to school because now they're sick with asthma, which means that they're going to have a poor education. And as uh, someone once said, if you have a poor education, uh, you're going to end up in a poor neighborhood with poor schools where you will remain poor. And I'm just paraphrasing Malcolm X, El Haj Malik Al Shabazz. And so, and it gets worse. The ash that was produced by the plant also end up being wound up being dumped in a black community called Salem Town. Well, Salem Town used to be black. It's now gentrified, it's white, there's nothing like it used to be. I'll talk about that later. But when I first moved to Nashville, I thought Nashville had volcanoes because the ash piles were so hot, they would tower over this neighborhood and they were they were still hot from coming out of the uh, thermal thermal facility. So they would smoke. It looked just like volcanoes um, right there in the, the black community of Salem town. And then talking about the path, the uh, path to hell being paved with good intentions, the city decided, OK, let's mitigate these ash piles. Let's cover them up with soil. But in order to get the soil, the city created an illegal soil mine in Bordeaux uh, where you had these huge trucks full of dirt rumbling past children on bus stops in Bordeaux. Uh, to mitigate the impacts of the thermal plant on the Salem town black community. So 
the thermal plant is, was just, like I said, it sounded like a good idea at the time. Uh, so that was the other half of Nashville's uh, trash. And the thermal plant, you have to understand, was a nasty, nasty, nasty place. Um, when I when I taught at Vanderbilt, I taught an environmental justice course at Vanderbilt, and Vanderbilt has a different kind of student from Tennessee State. And we used to, I used to take them on a toxic tour because my Vanderbilt students did not believe environmental injustice existed. They didn't believe it until we took the tour. And one of the first places I took them was the thermal plant. And the, tr the trucks would roll in and the smell was just awful. You can't imagine, unless you've been to a landfill, that smell. And I told the operator, just keep talking, keep talking. We're not, we're just gonna stand here and take it. And one of the young ladies said, Dr. Padgett, is this all the trash for Nashville for a whole year? And the operator said, no, this is half the trash for Nashville for one day. He said, you know where, he said, when you throw stuff away, this is a way. You know, there's no such place. This is a way, in case you didn't notice. So uh, it was a nasty, nasty facility. And it was right in the middle of what is now the tourism district in Nashville. We'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, so Nashville also has a, or had, a Brownfields program. And this gets us into a little bit of earth science. So the Brownfields program was a compromise to the uh, Superfund Act, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act of 1980. The Superfund law was a law that was put in place to clean up abandoned toxic waste sites. So prior to 1980, and I guess the first kind of Superfund site was the Love Canal. So if you're one of my students, just, just Google Love Canal, Lois Gibbs, long story, but out of that, what happened there was you had mostly white community near Buffalo, New York, that found out that their houses were built over a dump, a uh, toxic dump, not just any dump. And there was no recourse. There was no law that said it was illegal to leave toxic waste in the ground and then build an apartment complex or a whole neighborhood on top of it. And so Superfund was put in place uh, to mitigate that. And remember, this was under, well, maybe some of you remember, some of you don't remember, this was under the Carter administration. Some of you read, might read about this. This was under the Carter administration. So, you know, that, that was a different administration in terms of environmental protection. And so the Superfund Act is very stringent. The liability is strict. Doesn't matter how the waste got into the ground. Oh, it was an accident. No, you're still responsible. The liability was joint and several. So if 50 polluters dumped toxic waste into a pit and the government caught one, that one was responsible for all of it. Well, what about BP? What about Exxon? No, we just got you, Shell. Pay up. You know, so you had joint and several liability. The liability was also retroactive. Retroactive, which means that it didn't, doesn't matter how long ago it was. You know, there was no grandfather, grandmother and out of Superfund. Uh, when I worked my first job in California, my first job out of college, I worked in California for the Bureau of Land Management. And I worked on this site called the Atlas Mountain Mine Site. It was as big asbestos mine, not too far away from Stanford. Huge mine, asbestos mine that was a super fun site. There were people who got letters because their grandfathers or grandmothers had gold mining leases on that mountain in the 1800s. And they got a, a, a bill to clean up that. That's how far, it didn't matter whether it was your, that's how, so this is in the, it was a very strict law. And the most important part of Superfund with regard to cleanup is that if a potentially responsible party had to clean up a site, it had to be cleaned up to what's called background level. In other words, pristine. You'd have to, your, your, your baby should be able to roll around in the dirt on that site after it's cleaned up and not get sick. That That's, but that's very expensive. To clean up a site to that level is extremely expensive. So in cities, this uh, place in Nashville called Marathon Motor Works, which presumably was an old car plant, uh, when the plant, when a lot of the old vestiges of the industrial uh, time or industrial revolution went to rust, nobody wanted to touch them. Because if you, or, or, or in some cases, 
a lot of banks wound up stuck with these types of properties because they foreclosed on them, not realizing that this liability is strict. And then the federal government said, look, you're responsible for cleaning up this waste site bank. And the bank would be like, what, what are you talking about? This, this is your site, right? Well, yeah, we, 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 we have Marathon Motor Works. We're not a business. We foreclose on them. So now you own this property, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're responsible for cleaning up this property. Well, how much is it going to cost to clean up? Well, $300 million. Yeah, when I worked for um, the Bureau of Land Management, that was typically the price tag. I was a hazardous waste manager. That was typically the price tag for a cleanup, hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, I was just talking to the class a few minutes ago about how our culture, uh, how waste is such a big part of our culture and the fact that um, people make a lot of money uh, off, of, off of waste, i.e. waste management, not picking on any sin single company, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, yeah, the, the cleanup tag price tags are hundreds of millions of dollars. So if a developer wanted to come in and buy out this, this property uh, and then heard, oh, there might be some toxic waste on the site, not happening. So all over the country, you had these um, rusting factories, especially in the uh, old manufacturing belt of the Northeast. So the federal government made a compromise, and that's called the Brownfields Program. The Brownfields Program essentially says, okay, you got a site that probably has toxic waste. Tell you what, you don't have to clean it up to pristine levels. You can kind of clean it up halfway because nobody's going to live on this property that's maybe zoned commercial. I mean, so a lot of these properties were zoned industrial. Nobody was ever going to live here. They were zoned commercial. Nobody was ever going to live here. Uh, so why do they have to be cleaned up to pristine levels? So the Brownfield program gave developers and cities a chance to get some of these uh, abandoned properties back on the tax rolls. So they would lower the um, cleanup requirements and people would actually buy the property. So somebody bought this Marathon Motor Works company uh, under the Nashville Brownfields program. And now it's called the Nashville, the Marathon Music Works. Uh, you can go there and uh, I think there's a there's all kinds of things in there. There's, a, there's art studios, there's a, there's a concert theater. Nobody's living there. Uh, so some of that waste is still there, but um, it's, um, you know, no longer dangerous because people was well, dangerous, but not all the time. But if you look on the map on the left hand side, notice uh, the areas that are in the Nashville Brownfields program. Just keep an eye on 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 those. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that later. Um, so this is what the Brownfields program, now not that the Bordeaux landfill was a Brownfield site, after the um, uh, Delma Harper and the rest of the African-American activists in, in Nashville finally got the uh, uh, landfill closed in 1996, it's been converted into a, uh, it's the, the, they should have picked a better name, the Bordeaux landfill wildlife habitat but I guess they just wanted to be honest. But all the all of the garbage is still there. I mean, it's you know you got I don't I don't think that's a bald eagle. It's probably a red tail hawk, and I don't know what I guess. And those are probably wild turkeys. But it, you know you have this nice bucolic. But the all the garbage is still there. You know, so that's that's the thing to remember. Here's here's what happened to the thermal site. So now the thermal site has been transformed into the uh, Ascend Amphitheater. Uh, so, and this is, if I was to zoom out, this is right in the heart. I don't know how many of you all have been to Nashville. It seems like everybody's coming to Nashville now um, for some reason. Um, but this is right in the heart of the Second Avenue, Broadway, uh, Tourist District. Just, I think, west of here is the Country Music uh, Hall of Fame and Museum. A little bit up from that is the where the Predators play hockey. I mean, this is right in the heart of of um, Nashville's tourism district. And that's where that nasty, disgusting thermal plant was. So when that plant finally was, well, actually it burned down. Uh, and so it kind of gave the city an excuse to really get rid of it. Um, but now uh, that's what's there. And, and this is in part what I call green gentrification because after this site was transformed, a lot of what would have been affordable housing in this area is gone. I mean, there is nothing but three, four, five million dollar condos and very, uh, as my mother says, foo-foo restaurants around this area. 
you know, where you can spend the, you know, a lot of money and still leave afterwards to get something to eat. Um, so, and so there are still problems. This is in 2018, a couple of years ago. So even though I started in 1973, uh, Bordeaux is still under uh, duress. So this is the uh, environmental justice screening tool. Uh, it's produced by the Environmental Protection Agency. This is the uh, 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 NADA cancer risk uh, by census tract based upon the um, uh, risk index. And I don't have time to explain what it is, but the red areas, the red area symbols represent the worst or highest risk on a national scale in terms of exposure uh, to uh, air toxin cancer risk. And notice that here, this is Bordeaux, where, where you see red, that's basically Bordeaux. This other red area here, that's Casey Holmes, right? And so you can see that uh, we have still a long way to go before achieving environmental justice uh, in Nashville. This is from a couple of years ago. Uh, still, 2018, people still trying to put waste facilities in the Black community. And fortunately, and this is why especially tell younger people the importance of voting in all elections. Uh, you know, if don't only vote when Obama or, or Kamala is running, you know, vote all the time. Because fortunately, if it wasn't for these black city council persons, you know, who put the brakes on this waste facility, it would have been in our neighborhood. And, and Bordeaux is not that far from Tennessee State University. Um, uh, here's another project that I, I've, I've been working on, finally getting to some geology. Uh, so yes, there is a mine slash quarry in, also in Bordeaux. And so here's the community and here's the mine. Now the mine wanted to or wants to extend its permit. Um, however, uh, the community has fought against it. In fact, the permit was denied to mine above ground, but somehow the Rogers Group decided to get try to get a permit to continue to mine underground because you see, if we do all that blasting underground, it couldn't possibly harm all these homes around here because we'll be underground, underneath the homes. So of course, uh, the um, community contacted me, and I'm I'm just why me? Um, I was really busy at the time, and I tried to. I mean, I graduated from undergrad at Western Kentucky University, which has a really good geology program. Um, I Vanderbilt's right there. They have a geoscience program. But the people said, we want somebody who looks like us uh, to work for us. Do you know any other Black geoscientists who specialize in, in karst? Well, I guess that's me. So uh, I, I went to work. Here's the mine. You can see how large this site is. Notice the, um, you know, the, the limestone, that typical limestone pattern, and and uh, I'm not well. Normally, when I do these presentations, I'm I'm not going to bore you with the geology, but you all might actually be interested in the geology. So here's it's the uh, uh, Lipers and Cathy's uh, formations, limestone, so somewhat susceptible to uh, sinkhole collapse. You know, not really susceptible, but somewhat susceptible to sinkhole collapse. This is obviously a place where you would not want to be blasting. And what's interesting about Nashville is anytime there's blasting around here, there's lots of damage because for, I mean, I guess limestone flies a long way when, when it's blasted, not like granite or some other stones. So anytime there's a lot of times when there's blasting just under ordinary circumstances in Nashville, people's homes are damaged by flying rock. Um, and then sinkhole, you know, we all, a sinkhole happens when there's underground erosion. This is the crash course in hydro karst hydrogeology. And so what happens is when, when there's erosion that occurs underground, uh, the ground above it collapses. Um, I don't know if there's anybody, the students, I'm talking most of the students. If, do you all remember when that Corvette plant in Bowling Green collapsed and all those Corvettes fell into that, fell in the ground? You all might've heard about that. That was a sinkhole. So that's typical of what happens when we disturb the subsurface in this area. Um, and so here's just, uh, uh, so they're, they're trying to uh, uh, go underground. And so I've been helping the uh, Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition uh, in this fight. And, and part of the reason that I do these presentations is to emphasize the importance of having 
uh, specifically uh, uh, people of color, African American, earth scientists involved in these cases, because the majority of the environmental justice activist community uh, are social scientists. Uh, I work with Dr. Bullard, Dr. Robert Bullard, who is the father of environmental justice. Um, he's a sociologist. Um, Beverly Wright, Dr. Beverly Wright, she's also a sociologist. Paul Mahai is a sociologist. Um, Benjamin Chavis does have an undergraduate degree in chemistry. A lot of people don't know that, but he's a theologian. He's Reverend Benjamin Chavis. Uh, you have politicians, uh, but yet we're, we're dealing with geology, hydrogeology, uh, all kinds of um, earth system sciences issues. And you have to have someone with that kind of expertise when trying to make the case uh, against, you wouldn't believe some of the arguments that this company made for this underground mining being safe. I, I had to keep myself from laughing in, 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 the, in the community. But um, if they could have sold that to people that didn't have someone like me who could just check them and say, no, that's, that's not gonna fly. Um, here's some case studies that I'm gonna try to go through. I'm gonna go, only go through two of them. Um, I'm not gonna go through the recycling piece. Uh, okay, so this is a case of green gentrification that I was involved with, and I'll just go through it. So, um, let, me, oh, let me just go through the recycling. I'm not going to do the recycling this time. I was talking to the students about how I, it took me years to start the recycling program that still exists at Tennessee State. Okay, here we go. Uh, so this is a brownfield site it, in, in a part of the Nashville called um, Edge Hill. Edge Hill was another black community that is rapidly gentrifying. Uh, and so what you see here is what was left of a large uh, dry cleaning factory. So when you drop off your clothes to the dry cleaners, uh, they don't do anything there. They store your clothes there and they take it to the factory where they douse your clothes in chemicals, right? Whoever came up with the name dry cleaning was a genius, right? A dry cleaning. They, they could have called it chemical cleaning. Like, really? Trichloroethylene cleaning, percloethylene cleaning. I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to take my clothes there. Dry cleaning. Oh, dry cleaning. Even when I was a kid, my mother used to take clothes to the dry cleaners. I was confused. I said, Mom, dry? How, how is that possible? Oh, don't worry about it, baby. You know, we just, we just need to get these clothes clean. So, but this plant operated in the middle of a Black community for literally a hundred years. And this is before we had any stringent environmental laws. So perchloroethylene and all kinds of toxic substances were doused into this soil. Then the plant closed down and was just sitting there empty, it became a brownfield site. So the owner negotiated to have the site cleaned up at a reduced cost. He was free from third party liability so you future attorneys, look that up, third party liability. In other words, let me quickly, if someone in the community said that they got sick because of the uh, toxins from this uh, dry, that closed down dry cleaning plant, plant, the government would block them from filing suit for damages. Okay, well, why is that? Well, that's an incentive to the landowner to move forward and come forward and expose him or herself to the fact that there are toxins on the site. If, if there wasn't that third party liability protection, who would be crazy enough to come out and admit that, yeah, for 100 years, we've been contaminating your community and there's probably a cancer cluster there. Lawyers would be lined up to, to, to join in on that suit. As a matter of fact, just as an aside, when I was involved with this case, I had to try to explain now the community did have an attorney. I had to try to explain to the attorney the hydrogeology, uh, and, and no offense to the attorneys in here, but you know, attorneys are people who who run away from science courses their entire undergraduate career. And, and I know because I went to law school for a while. I was going to be an environmental attorney, then I decided to do something else. Uh, so, so I remember trying to. I was trying to be as basic as possible to the, to not just one attorney, to several attorneys. And after about five minutes, I paused and said, okay, uh, are, how's everybody doing? And the attorney said, we're lost. And I said, well, when did you become lost? They said, we became lost right after you said, good morning, my name's Dr. Padgett. You know, then after that, everything after that was just, so 
they couldn't understand what was happening here in terms of the, uh, uh, the geology. Um, now, what happened was the government made a compromise. They allowed for the um, cleanup to be in situ. Uh, what, what that means is it's an alternative cleanup plan. Now, under ordinary circumstances, if this was a Superfund site, all of the contaminated soil would have to be removed. All of it, all of it, the buildings torn down, down to the down to nothing, and it would have to be trees and and birds chirping on the property uh, under Superfund law as it is originally intended. But under the Brownfields law, you use you can use these alternative cleanup strategies. And so what they did was injected some kind of uh, microbe into the subsurface that would eat the toxins. Yes, yes. So that that's that's called an in situ, in situ uh, bioremediation. Uh, that's what they were allowed to do at this site. The community said, "No, that's not good enough," and they fought. And the residents said, "I don't know about this halfway cleanup." Uh, and studies have shown that these types of alternative cleanups are more likely to be practiced in people of color in poor communities and other communities. Uh, in other words, wealthy communities would say, no, you gotta get all this waste out of here. Here's more geology. So this is the area in and around the, um, uh, where the dry cleaning plant used to be. And so under ordinary circumstances, um, you learn something in a hydrogeology course called transmissivity. Uh, so the transmissivity of soil under ordinary circumstances is maybe liquids might flow through the soil maybe a foot per year, kind of slow, or maybe three or four feet per year. In karst terrain, I've done dye traces where we've seen water move through some of these caves a half mile in a couple of hours. You know, it's almost like just having pipes underground. So imagine you now have toxins from that dry cleaning facility free flowing underground and going far past the, the um, boundaries of the um, property. And so here's some more geology. Here's the structural geology. And you can see the karst limestone, very thin soil cap. Uh, and so that's due to the um, remnants of the uh, uh, last ice age melt back. And so you don't have a lot of topsoil. Uh, people have very few basements in this area because it's, you can just scrape and you're right at solid rock here. It's not like being in Kansas or, or Nebraska where you can go through 15 feet of soil before you hit solid rock. So the solid rock is right there, no soil to absorb anything. Uh, let's see, here's some uh, well log um, uh, well log results and you hear here you have perchloroethylene, trichloroethylene, Stoddard solution. Uh, let's see, I think I have another one. Yeah, here's one, vinyl chloride. I mean, look at some of the levels of vinyl. Vinyl chloride is something that you do not want your breakfast cereal at all ever. Uh, um, so, when I was um, when I was working in California, I I I took a um, I, I audited a class called environmental toxicology. So for the students, I know some a lot of my students are are STEM or science majors. Some of you have probably taken organic chemistry. Etox is like OCHEM on steroids. This is one of the hardest classes I ever took. Thank goodness I was auditing. But one of the things that we learned in that course was that you could take a substance like, say, gasoline, which is already toxic. And if you don't realize how toxic gasoline is, the next time you go to the pump, read what's on that label that's on the pump. Just read it. Next time, you'll be glad you have a mask on when you're pumping your gas, right? But gasoline is toxic enough. But gasoline, when it breaks down, it breaks down to, e to even worse stuff like benzene and toluene. So um, the belief before we became aware was that nature would break down all of these chemicals. Yeah, they break down into stuff that's even worse, like vinyl chloride. Uh, look, Google vinyl chloride uh, and see, and that's what, that's what was in the ground. Remember, this dry cleaning plant was there for 100 years, literally, um, before it was closed down. And so this is the uh, potentiometric surface, I believe. And this just shows us the direction of flow of water underground. Um, and then here is, I think this is the plume. This is the perchloroethylene plume. 
And here's the, the, the property boundary. So you can see the perk, the perk goes far beyond the property boundaries. You know. And here's another, here's a trichloroethylene, trichloroethylene and perchloroethylene. Uh, some of the, they, they attack the kidneys and other um, organs. And in fact, when I used to work for the highway department, we used to do, we used to test the consistency of uh, concrete. And so what happens is when, when contractors build a road, they have to use a very specific mix of concrete but sometimes they'll cheat because they'll run out of a certain uh, size stone. And if they cheat, what happens is, have you ever gone down a road and it's full of potholes? That's what happens when you use an improper mix. So we would have to test the concrete by dissolving it, breaking it down to make sure the components were proper. Guess what we use to dissolve the concrete? Trichloroethylene. That's what that does. It eats concrete. That's what's been flowing out. That's what they... That's what they uh, walk, dry clean your clothes in, <laughs> the dry cleaners, the same stuff that eats concrete. Uh, and you can see the levels that it's at in um, beneath this property. Uh, it's more blah, blah, blah. So anyway, obviously because of the risks involved, uh, the community did not want this site to go through a halfway cleanup. But of course the city said it was okay. Notice, notice the headline, development called safe as long as tainted soil is left undisturbed. Wait a minute, safe, tainted in the same sentence? Um, undisturbed, let's look at what undisturbed means. So let's see, so does that look undisturbed to you? What about this? It looks like there's a lot of disturbance. So um, we lost this one, you know, I mean, I tried, we, you know, and the real fight was that the landowner wanted to convert this property into commercial land use. He wanted to be zoned commercial. So we just were learning about zoning in my class right now, uh, as opposed to residential, because he knew he would make more money if it was commercial. But Edgehill was a rapidly gentrifying community. And so the black people in the community did not, they knew if it went commercial, they would probably develop into something that is not in the tradition of the community. And sure enough, it did. So um, the dr old dry cleaning facility was converted into this retail place called Edge Hill Village, where among other things, there's a really, really expensive restaurant there that most people in the neighborhood can't afford to eat at. Um, there's also a place where, not you, but your dog can get a massage and a mani-pedi. Yeah, not you, your dog can get a massage, right? Now, when I grew up in Baltimore, the dog was in the backyard with a chain and and we went to see him every now and then. You need to bark if somebody tries to break in, but no massages. And then, of course, the, the bellwether of gentrification, as you can see here, the coffee shop, where you can pay $8 for a latte. Uh, you know, Again, so this is the end result of what we call green gentrification. So you had a waste site there when the community was Black, but now the community is gentrifying, and then this is what you get in its place. And if you look at this map, remember that map of the brownfield development? Here's Edge Hill. This is a map of gentrification in, in Nashville. Notice that these census tracts are the same census tracts approximately that we saw brownfields programs are the same ones that today are the most gentrified. So this is what we call green gentrification. When a community is black and poor, has a waste site, it gets cleaned up under Brownfields program. And then the next thing you know, the people who were living next to the waste site can't afford to live there after it's cleaned up. They get moved out if they were renting. The uh, um, the landlord who owns the building or owns the property says, wow, you know, I can sell and have these, uh, I can sell this old ratty apartment building and 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 have my property sold to this developer that wants to put these uh, $300,000, $400,000 condos where people can walk their dog down to this doggy spa and, and, and get them a massage and then drink a $10 cup of coffee. I mean, that, that's, that's what green gentrification is. And there are, there's a large movement against this uh, happening because in many cases, when Brownfield's pro um, property is cleaned up, the businesses do not hire people from the community even though they tout that. They'll say, well, yes, uh, we'll, we'll hire some people from the community. Study research shows that this, this does not happen. 
Um, and in fact, make, making matters worse, um, there have been reports that young African-American children, well, boys, carrying backpacks on their way to school who live in this neighborhood have had the police called on them for looking suspicious. I mean, we see some young black guys with backpacks in the neighborhood. Well, yeah, they're coming home from school. Uh, and they were here before you were, but anyway, so, so this is just another one of the things that we're fighting against. Um, let's see, I've got a couple minutes. Uh, now this case was the, uh, 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 an infamous case of the uh, Dixon County landfill. So what happened in this case was uh, the county of Dixon County learned that the private wells were contaminated by the nearby landfill. Took all the white people in the community off of their private wells on the city water or county water, left the black people drinking this tainted water for another nine to 12 years. Uh, I was able to, um, get Dr. Robert Bullard, the father of environmental ju justice involved in this case. And, um, and in fact, he said, and this is the father of environmental justice, Dr. Robert Bullard, he said that this case was the worst case of environmental racism he had ever seen. That's what Dr. Bullard said. Um, and so again, we've got various, uh, here, here are the black people's uh, wells, you can see various levels of, of trichloroethylene and other substances that were collected over time. And these people were allowed to continue to drink this water. Uh, I know that Harry Holt, um, the, one of the, the families that was one of the main uh, protagonists, he died of cancer. Uh, Sheila Holt, his daughter, is a breast cancer survivor. Um, very hard to prove the link between those two. Um, but, and so there's where the, um, Dixie County landfill, there's a topography there. And then of course, uh, Dixon County is again, karst hydrology, very uh, high transmissivity um, and through flow, not much of a soil cap. So there's almost direct uh, uh, direct infiltration of, of surface flow in the underground. And so you can just see that toxic constituents could easily, easily get to someone's private well. Uh, for those of you who grew up in the city, like I did, and thinking, well, what's a private well? Um, most of us get our water from the municipal supply. The city provides it. But in rural areas, uh, and even in some cities, I was just in Pensacola, where a lot of people are still on private wells in, in Florida. <laughs> anyway, that's, but um, so some people just have a well drilled right at their house, and they have a pump. And it just drills down, maybe 120, 175 feet uh, into an into the into groundwater, and they pump the water right out of the ground right there. It doesn't come from the city, um, but you can see how that can be an unsafe situation if that aquifer becomes contaminated, and that's what happened in Dixon County. Um, and so here is just some pictures. This picture is taken from the front yard of the Hope family, and there's the landfill. It's right there. You know, and so this, they allowed those people to drink water from a private well, knowing that this unlined landfill, by an unlined landfill, it means it has no liner, no liner uh, beneath it. This is an older landfill. And so um, anyway, so those are a couple of the sources on this case. Now, this case did have a happy ending, I guess. So the Hope family, uh, the National Resources Defense Council came uh, to their defense and provided pro bono legal services. And they did win a settlement uh, after this case. Unfortunately, like I said, uh, Harry Holt here in the red hat passed away during uh, the time that we were in this fight. Uh, and so, like I said, there was a somewhat uh, happy and happy story. And uh, I guess Sheila Holt here in the white, uh, she is in the process of having a movie made about uh, this story. And uh, she asked, you know, who should play me? And of course I said, Denzel. I mean, who else? Who else but Denzel? Play me. Just, just kidding. But um, yeah, but she's trying to make a movie made, get a movie made about the uh, uh, the case. So that is uh, all I have within the this hour. I think I made it. <laughs> all right. 
Great. Um, maybe we can open up the floor to some questions. Really amazing stuff. Thank you so much. Let me, all right, I got to open up the participants list so I can see if you can just raise your hand. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, Richard, why don't you go ahead? You're muted, Richard. Doing this every day and I still mute myself. Thank you, Professor yeah. Padgett, for this really uh, amazing talk and all these case studies. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about your role, but also the role more broadly of academics in supporting communities um, as scholars, as researchers. What are, what are the pathways by which you see the academy being really supportive um, in your immediate community, maybe more broadly and more generally? Yeah, well, I mean, the main thing is that we, you know, we put the community needs first. Um, anytime, and, and I'm, I've learned almost everything I've know from Dr. Bullitt and Dr. Wright, and what they've have always done is put community-based organizations and stakeholders on the payroll. So if, if I get a grant, uh, part of that line goes to them. You know, and so, but a lot of times people will ask people, uh, environmental justice stakeholders to volunteer. Uh, everybody else is getting paid. The PI is getting paid. The, 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 the grassroots are getting paid. The consultants are getting paid. Everybody gets paid except for the people in the community, right? No, we don't do that. You know, I've always have a line in there uh, for the community-based organizations and stakeholders. Uh, and the second thing is that we have to, um, I tell my students this. I used to, 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 to force my students to give public presentations to ninth graders. I said, yeah, you're really smart. Can you explain this to a ninth grader? Uh, if you can't, then you're not doing anybody any good. You know, all the dollar and 50 cent words in the world uh, aren't going to help people who are maybe driving a school bus or working in the cafeteria uh, or crossing garden. And that's, that's who we're working. That's who we're trying to help. And nobody's going to be impressed by your, you know, by your great vocabulary. And that's that's really hard for for some of us in academia, uh, who, you know, like to, you know, because when we go to a conference, you want to be like, and, you know, and the transmissivity of the subsurface and blah blah blah, you know that. But you can't say that to Ms. Jenkins. You know, you have to say to Ms. Jenkins. You know how you use that sponge, Ms. Jenkins, and that water flows through that sponge. That's how the ground is, just like that. And if that sponge, you got dirt in that sponge, it's gonna what's gonna happen? It's gonna it's gonna flow out of that sponge all over. Yeah, yeah, you got it, Ms. Jenkins. That's right. You know, so that's and also, um, I learned a, a tough lesson years ago. I was a graduate student. I was a master student when I first started getting into environmental justice, and I was work. I was fight. I was working on the behalf of this. Um, of this community in Jacksonville, Florida that had been built over top of a, of a toxic waste site. And so we were trying to convince the city of Jacksonville to move these people to a safe location. Of course, the city said that they were broke. Meanwhile, they're building an $80 million stadium across town for some football team, right? So I went to the uh, public meeting and I'm up there and I'm going on about how you know, the chemicals and blah, blah, blah. And one of the council persons leaned back and said, Mr. Pad, do you live in that housing project? She's from Jacksonville. And I said, no, sir. Why are you here? Why are you here? Working on master thesis, ain't you? And the people in the housing project started looking at me like, yeah, why are you here, brother? So I, I never do, do that again. You know, it, I put the people first. They stand up at the public meeting. And unless another hydrogeologist or another PhD stands up on the other side, I'm sitting down. You know, so the people have to have to be taught to understand all this geoscience and fight their own battles. You know, we empower people to fight for themselves. We don't go in there and try to fight battles for communities where we don't live, right? We don't do that. So that that's that's my advice to academia. Thank you. Kevin, did you have a question? No, okay. Anyone else? Oh, uh, Noah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Professor Padgett. That was um, super interesting. Um, I have a question about the green 
um, gentrification and um, the relationship between the green gentrification and the kind of partial um, remediation that you also described. And do we know whether there's a relationship sort of in the level of remediation and the level of gentrification that occurs? I guess another way to put it is our, um, where there are interests that are sort of driving the gentrification, are they more willing, you know, do more resources go into greater remediation in the areas that end up with greater green gentrification? I guess that's a hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I know, I know that there's been a relationship uh, in the literature between uh, places that, you know, that, that lower income communities are more likely to have the experimental types of cleanups uh, or alternative cleanups as opposed to complete remediation. Um, yeah, before I go on, if there are any of my students here, um, yeah, we're gonna migrate back to, uh, we're not done yet, sorry. Uh, we're going <laughs> to migrate back for the third hour of class. So I, I, I kept these other Zoom room open. So you can just start going back there. Um, I just need to, I had to say that. Uh, but thanks. Thanks for my students for being here. Hopefully, you, hopefully you learned something. Um, but yeah, but it's but yeah, I've, I've there has been literature that shows that these um, experimental um, remediation plans are used primarily in lower income communities and and people of color communities. And I've, I've, I've seen some of them, some of them that did not work. There was a super fun site in Florida and um, in a black community and a Kmart was built over top of it. It was fine for 10 years, right? But remember Florida has a very high, very uh, well, shallow water table. And they did, um, I guess the plan was to stabilize the toxic constituents with concrete. So there was a 10 foot concrete block put between the contaminated portion of the uh, surficial aquifer, because you know, Florida has a three aquifer system. And the belief was that, okay, it's fine. Maybe 10 years later, that those substances ate through that concrete and people were walking through the Kmart and the tiles were coming up and it was the chemicals. So they weren't pumped out of the ground completely. It was a um, experimental in situ remediation process that didn't work. And uh, a lot of people, um, yeah, it was, it was bad. And th that's not the only case of where these um, experimental cleanup processes don't go correctly. Uh, and it's, it's amazing. Sometimes they work perfectly. And if there's one thing that's different about the water chemistry or the geochemistry at another site with the exact same contaminants, doesn't work. And, uh, but yeah, but that's, that's the compromise that is made with brownfield sites because otherwise they'd be too expensive to clean up. Thanks. All right, it looks like we're just about out of time. David, I wanna thank you so much for, I mean, literally sharing your class with us today. That was, that was amazing um, and uh, really incredibly informative. Uh, I, I think you're literally putting Nashville on the map for environmental justice, so congratulations on that. Um, yeah, you know, thanks. Thanks again. And uh, good luck with everything. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having my students. You know, the students. Oh, have, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they've complained in this virtual environment that this professor is just giving us all this busy work. So I'm like, no, see, this is, this is real stuff here. So thank you for letting them come and, and watch. Absolutely. Our pleasure. All right. Okay. Take care now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.